Greetings and salutations and thank you for clicking on this video. Welcome to the Easy Linux Q&A episode 11. I haven't done one of these in quite some time. I posted on Facebook and I asked for people to submit questions and I got a few from there. Some of these questions also come from emails that I've gotten through the Easy Linux site on the Contact Us page and a few of them come from YouTube comments as well. So I figured we'd jump in and answer some of your questions. But before we get into that, I want to show you this. This is a picture I took off my front porch this morning. This is the water tower across the street. And this is where all the noise in the background comes from. I've commented on this on a couple of videos and somebody said, what are your neighbors doing, man? It's not the neighbors, it's the city. They're out there sandblasting this thing. They're going to repaint it, and at the rate they're going, I think it's going to be probably fall before they quit. So just wanted to point that out because I'm sure you can hear it a little bit in the background. If I walk out on the front porch, it kind of sounds like I'm standing on the flight line at an Air Force base with an entire flight of fighters getting ready to take off. So nothing I can do about it. Okay, so let's jump into y'all questions. We got some good ones this time around. First question is from Ramsey or Ramsey, however you pronounce that. My question is, what is the right way to set up Linux? Mint, for example, alongside with my Windows 7, do I need to create many partitions for Linux system as home folder, root, swap, etc.? Is one partition enough for the whole package? What else should I consider while setting up Linux beside my Windows 7? Many thanks in advance. Those of you who have been around my channel for a while will know that I am not a fan of the idea of dual booting because dual booting presents all kinds of issues, problems, especially for people who do not understand how computers work. And I posted a video probably two years ago now called the dual boot deception. Most people didn't get it because they uh, nerds tend to have tunnel vision. They only see things the way they see them and they don't understand what other people's use cases are and in that video what I was talking about was the fact that with Ubuntu and many other distributions of Linux that have simplified installers if it sees that you have Windows 7 on the machine or Windows or another operating system doesn't matter what it is what it's going to do is it's going to offer to set up a dual boot situation in one click and that works most of the time, but sometimes it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, it really doesn't work. You can end up with a situation where one or the other of the operating systems will not boot. You can end up having the Windows installation become unstable. It can also make the Linux side unstable. And every time I say this in a video, there's always nerds out there that got to post and go, well, I've been dual booting for 10 years and I've never had a problem. What are you talking about? Well, that's you. That's because you know how it works. Some people don't. So that was the point of that video. Also, dual booting is not the greatest experience. It's not the best way to learn Linux because what happens is, is that you're playing around in Linux and then you realize you come up on something that you don't know how to do so you don't have time to learn how to do it so now you've got to jump over and boot into Windows and then you've got to do that and maybe you might be in Windows and you go oh I was doing something over on the Linux side and it's back and forth and there's exchanging files it gets very complicated especially for folks who don't really understand the process so the answer to your question Ramsey is going to depend a great deal on your level of expertise. If you are somebody who is used to partitioning disks, if you are somebody who understands how bootloaders work and what's going on, then you can set up as many partitions as you like. Do you have to set up separate partitions for home root swap? The answer is no. And most likely, if you're going to be doing that on one hard drive, you're going to want to keep that partition table as simple as possible. What I recommend is if you're not really hip to all of that and you still want to do it, that you should let the installer do it automatically. It will make the decisions of how to shrink the Windows partitions and where to put Linux. And it will generally do it in one great big partition. So the entire Linux system will be in just one partition and depending on what version, uh, well, Linux Mint, what it's going to do is it's going to create 
a separate swap partition somewhere on the disk. And that swap partition will be a little bit bigger than your installed RAM. So you'll end up with two extra partitions after the Windows partitions are resized. Some of the things to keep in mind when you're going to attempt to do this is the fact that you need to have backups of every piece of data on that machine that you want to keep. So don't do this and then not have your Windows data backed up and then if the machine doesn't boot back up and it doesn't work and you can't gain access to it then uh, you've just lost it. Also you need to be able to have installation media for Windows as well if you if you intend to restore it. If you have a restore partition on the drive and the partition table gets trashed entirely then you, it won't do you any good. I mean you have to have physical media to install Windows from whether it, that be a DVD or a USB stick or something you need to have some way to get back to it because if it doesn't work <laughs> that's going to be what probably what you're going to want to do right and when you do your backups you need to do those on separate drives not drives that are within the machine and plugged in I'm talking about an external drive a USB drive a USB stick something like that so that it's not hooked up to the machine while the installs in progress because there is always the outside chance that the installer while it's doing its thing could get confused and blow out your backup drive so there you go that's what I got to say uh, let the installer do it if you're not a hundred percent sure about setting up partitions and you should be alright it usually does a pretty good job it works probably about ninety percent of the time and about ten percent of the time it makes a mistake and ends up messing something up um, and I will add this I think the best way to get started with Linux is not running Linux in a virtual machine. It's not dual booting. I think the best way to get started with Linux is to get another machine. It doesn't have to be a super expensive machine. It could be a little laptop that you pick up on eBay, uh, one that will run Linux, and you put that to the side, and you have that be your Linux machine, and you play with it, and you leave your main system, whether that be Mac or Windows, alone. Because you, you, you're, it takes a while to get confident to be able to do more in Linux and so you don't want to mess up your main system and if you run into a situation where you say okay well I don't like Linux it's not for me you haven't lost anything other than this little computer and you could always buy a Windows license and you could load Windows on that you could get back to where you were most of the machines you do buy like that come with Windows installed swap the hard drive out first Take the hard drive, put it to the side, stick another drive in the machine, and then install Linux on it. If you don't like Linux, doesn't work, or whatever, stick the Windows drive back in it, boot up, and go on. So, yeah, make give yourself lots of options. Uh, the, the one thing that you absolutely don't want to do is just to back up all your data and then format your machine with Linux and expect it to work exactly like Windows, because if you do that, you are going to be very, very, very frustrated. So that's my thoughts on that. Cinnamon on Ubuntu. Joe, you did a video on the Cinnamon desktop for Ubuntu a while back. Does it work in 16.04 and newer? Same terminal code? Eddie Gass, he left me that question. Well, yeah, I did this thing a couple of years ago where I posted a bunch of videos about putting Cinnamon on the Ubuntu operating system because it's it wasn't really natively available for it and that was Ubuntu 1404 so a lot has changed from 1404 to 1604 I am absolutely sure that there is a way to do that if you want to install the cinnamon desktop and I bet you anything that a quick Google search will find you instructions on how to do it when I did that a couple of years ago I did it for a couple of reasons number one at that point in time Linux Mint was having some issues that I was trying to get away from so I wanted an Ubuntu base with cinnamon and the other reason I did it was just out of curiosity I wanted to see if I could actually pull it off and for a little while there I entertained the idea of turning this into kinda of like my own little easy Linux distribution Ubuntu with cinnamon what I found out was is that cinnamon requires a lot of tweaks to run well on anything but mint so even the cinnamon desktop that you get let's say from Manjaro they have a cinnamon version there's a cinnamon version of arch you're not going to get the polish that you would get from Linux Mint it takes a lot of tweaking and 
so these days, I just say, look, if you really want cinnamon, why don't you use mint? Mint 18 is awesome. If you like Ubuntu 16.04, then Linux Mint 18 is going to work probably just as well for you. So I don't really see the need to do that anymore. But if you want to do it, you can. I did that a couple of years ago, like I said, on Ubuntu 14.04. And no, probably the same code definitely doesn't apply. It's probably not going to work, but I haven't looked at it in a long time. So, Cinnamon is cool, and it's available on a lot of distros, but Cinnamon works best on Mint because it's their project and they do the polish. Why do you choose Linux over other OSs? And this comes from Giorgio, or I, I guess I'm saying that right, Georgios. However you pronounce your name, thank you for your question. I do appreciate it. I'm sorry that I'm probably massacring it uh, this I mean how much time do we got here I mean I could go on all day about why I like Linux better than other operating systems and I put a lot of thought into this because it was such a simple question but I think that the main thing that I can tell you is that I like it because it's free and I also like it because it it works like Unix so I was always fascinated with Unix way back a long time ago before there was a such thing as an internet I worked for a company that had a mini computer and we had Unix terminals all over the place and I had played with home computers and jumped on BBS's and that sort of thing but when I got on this machine and it was network enabled and we could tap into all kinds of resources I was really bowled over by it I liked the system I didn't really dig too deep in the system back then but I got interested again probably about 1998 when I heard about this thing called Linux and the first time I ever saw Linux running on a machine was at the computer lab in at Gateway Computer in Hampton and they had like open Caldera 1.3 running it was this would have been like 1999 and that's when I started learning about Linux and over the years that's just become more and more and more a part of my life and but like I said the main thing is that it's free and I don't mean free necessarily like free beer like it's yeah it's free to download you can download Linux for free from a lot of places but it's free in the sense of you can do whatever you want with it and it doesn't hide anything from you and you can contribute to the community and you can change it to do whatever you want it to do you can customize it and nobody's going to give you any problems with it. You can redistribute it. You can give it to somebody else and nobody cares because everything is done under the GPL, the GNU public license. And so that is what's in there. Whereas if you tried to do a lot of what I do with Linux, with Mac or Microsoft or something like that, there's, they, you know, I'd be a pirate. I can't just carry a, a disk over to somebody else's house and go, here, I'm going to install this for you and set it up. And the other thing about Linux is the fact that it doesn't ask much from you and it doesn't hide anything from you either. So what I mean by that is that if you go out and you buy a device that has a commercial operating system on it, whether it be Windows, Mac, or Android, or Chrome OS, whatever it is, like a Chromebook, the first thing that you have to do is you have to give your personal information to somebody so you can use it because you're going to have to get a, an account with the App Store. They want your credit card. You have to activate the system. You have to register. You have to tell them all this information about yourself or you can't use it. Linux doesn't work that way. Linux is download it, install it, enjoy. That's it. You never have to register. You don't have to give anybody your email address. You don't have to do any of this stuff. If you sign up for an account that has something to do with Linux, then you're doing that completely voluntarily. If you pay for software that runs on Linux and you're buying it from a company that you need to register and give them your information, that's entirely up to you. If you want to do it, you go right ahead. If not, don't worry about it. Don't use that software. So it gives you choices. It gives you freedom. And I mean, for instance, doing these videos, I used to do videos about Windows years ago. You will notice that there's not one single video up here that directly talks about Windows anymore. And there's a reason for that. Because Microsoft decided that folks like me who do YouTube videos, if we showed a Windows desktop, then we were infringing on copyright. 
And so therefore, they actually started busting people on YouTube. This has been about two or three years ago for Windows videos. And at that point, I took every single one of them down because it was like, you dummies. I mean, this is how they communicate. This is how we communicate in a community is we post things. We put videos up. And these people were so stupid that they went and hired a company to go through YouTube. And anybody who had posted any kind of game or anything that was a Microsoft copyright, they were coming after, including simple videos like how do I format a disk in Windows? They were coming after people for that. I was like, you bastards. I was like, no way. And then there's the security issues as well with Windows, and I'm not even going to get into all of that, but Windows is a sieve, and you, you, when you put that on there, there's so many back doors and security problems that, put it this way, at this point in time, I would be afraid to use Windows because I'm so used to being in a more secure environment, which is Linux. And I've never had any problems with hacking or people getting into my system or something like that. And I'm not going to because it's just an inherently more secure system than Microsoft offers. And so there you go. But yeah, this is non-proprietary. This is open source. It is free, which means that it respects the user. And I'm actually getting to a point where when people start comparing Windows to Linux or Mac to Linux or even Android to Linux. I get mad because you're comparing apples to oranges. All of those systems represent something that is controlled by a mega corporation. So in the case of Windows, it's Microsoft. Mac, it's Apple. Android, it's Google. Chrome OS, that's Google. All of these different systems that are out there, they're controlled by these mega corporations. Linux is not controlled by anybody like that. There is no corporation. There are corporations that use Linux. There are corporations that sell you support for Linux. But Linux itself is not controlled. It's a community. It's not a project, product. It's not a corporation. It's a community. So basically what it is is that if you download OpenSUSE and you don't like something about it, you can change it if you have the wherewithal to do that. You could contribute back to the OpenSUSE project. You can do the same thing pretty much with all Linux, to all different distributions of Linux to some level, to some degree or another. Canonical tends to be a little less responsive to the community as far as upstream contributions, but we're not going to get into all that politics. You can still change it to do whatever you want it to do. And I think that is the future of computing. I think it empowers people. I think that it's since you take the economics out of it and you take the fact that people have to essentially give some corporation all of their personal information in order to use something, you take that away from it, it's free. It's free in the sense of do what you will with it. Here's the technology. If you take the time to learn it, if you participate in the community, it's a very, 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 very rewarding experience. So there you go. Hope that answers that question. Desktop confusion. You were highly recommending Cinnamon, and the other day you touted the XFCE as the best desktop. Why yet another recommendation? What are you really recommending for a Linux distro for the average housewife, senior, or nerd to install? Please make a video and clear this up so that Windows 10 can be really be challenged. Don Benoit. Well, Don... I didn't recommend XFCE in that video. I know exactly which one you're talking about. I posted a video, the last one that I did actually, where I was talking about how impressed I was with Linux Mint XFCE. And I am so impressed with Linux Mint XFCE that I'm buying a computer to run it. And I'm working on getting that in here real soon because I installed it on hardware on my Dell machine that I ordinarily use. And uh, in the video I said that I didn't have the audio issues. Well, guess what? Next day it popped up. It started popping and skipping on the audio. So uh, I was like, okay, that's it. So I'm working on getting another machine. And when that comes, I will run it because I felt like that that was, for me, the best desktop experience that I had had with Linux Mint in a long, long time. And I even stated in the video, when people come along and they are brand new to Linux, so if you're talking about housewives, seniors, or nerds to install, and they are brand new to Linux, I always put them on Cinnamon if I can. 
if they have a machine that they're installing that won't run cinnamon because it's really low resources then i will consider putting them on xfce or the mate desktop one of the two linux mint offers several desktop experiences and they're all really good depending on what you do uh, i mean what, what your personal preferences are but cinnamon seems to be the easiest one for people to transition to who are used to working with like Windows 7 and Windows 8. They're used to that Aero desktop that's on there and Cinnamon works close enough the same way, it's laid out very similarly that people don't feel uh, like they're stepping into a foreign country when they're using it and Cinnamon is, it's a good desktop. I, I like Cinnamon a lot but when I started playing around with XFCE in that video I just I, well, before I did the video, I was just really impressed with it because of the way you could tweak it and you could get it to look and act exactly the way you wanted it to do. And that's what I was commenting on. So those who come to the channel and, and haven't been around for a while and they haven't gone back and looked at the other videos, I think that they take if I do a, a video about a distribution or a desktop, they take that as being the the absolute definite end all be all. This is what I'm going to do, and uh, they take it like I'm just somebody who's just changing my Linux distribution and I found something. I do videos about all kinds of desktops and, and distributions of Linux and sometimes I recommend it and sometimes I don't. But it's always with the caveat of is this going to work for you. Now in that video I did say that I thought that I would probably recommend XFCE to certain users. So if I come across somebody who's just a little smarter than the average bear and they like to tinker with the desktop and they want to be able to configure it then I'll suggest XFCE and say hey I think you'd really like this why don't you give it a try but for somebody who is not interested in customizing their desktop or whatever cinnamon works fine I mean even changing the themes is just a matter of two or three clicks you just choose what you want and put it together it's super easy to use whereas XFCE still easy to use but there's a lot more that you can change so there you go I hope that answers your question there are a ton of different desktops out there and I like a lot of them I like I like what I see and I'll tell you when I like it but I usually will not be too negative in a video I don't want to just get on here and trash some open source project that's trying to do the best they can and when I, but when I find something I really like that's done well I'm gonna put it up there what works for me right now on the hardware that I have is Linux Mint with the Cinnamon desktop. I have three machines in this house that run that setup. That's what I use on a day-to-day -day basis. When I get the new machine I'm going to switch to XFCE because I just have to get off of this old hardware on this particular machine. The one that I'm probably going to get is not new either but it's all Intel inside so I know the drivers are going to work better. When I bought the machine that I usually do videos on these days I, it was running Windows 7 that was a long time ago and I wasn't really aware of the what works best with Linux and that sort of thing so it's amazing to me it works as well as it does and if I am careful about what kernel I put on great but anyway so there you go and I do have other machines I can do videos on this is just the one that's the most convenient to work with to tell you the truth I've got a couple anyway that's enough so I hope that makes sense uh, yeah I'm gonna post when I see something that I think is cool or I want to check out I'm gonna post a video it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an end-all be-all recommendation what I tell people who come to easy Linux is Linux Mint that's what I recommend these days and most people ask for it as well so there you go remote desktop Hi Joe, can I ask what's the best OS application for remote desktop control on different platforms OS's thinks? Well, the the first answer I'm going to give you is SSH, the secure shell, because it works on pretty much every device on the planet and you can put SSH clients on and SSH servers on anything and you can use it to log into another system and you'll have access to the shell and you can do whatever you want to do for administrative tasks it's great SSH also has X forwarding which means that you can open up a application on a remote machine that needs GUI support and it will send the instructions on how to draw the image that you see on your screen to the local machine 
and that works great for little things that you might open up like settings boxes little GUI based programs text editors stuff like that it doesn't really work well with great big uh, web browsers and things like that but if you're logging into a machine and you're doing administration SSH is definitely the way to go if you are working with people who are not real computer savvy then the one that I really like is team viewer it's a proprietary application I know that and but if I'm working with somebody and I'm giving them support it's really easy to just go on and say okay go download this software and then we can do a one-time login with a password that goes back and forth and that you know they put their password in and they hook up to my machine or however it works and we do that one time and when we're done it's broken and then they can just uninstall or remove team viewer and then they don't have a problem with it uh, ever you know it's not running in the background it's not opening up ports it's not doing stuff like that so that's what I use for a like a one-time situation where I absolutely positively have to see the whole desktop but that's my recommendation for it SSH is just the bomb it is it's built in to pretty much every it, it is built into every Linux distribution out there it's built into it's available on Mac it's available on Windows it's available on Unix it's available on your toaster if it has a uh, some sort of IOT thing going on Internet of Things you can SSH into anything so that's what I recommend SSH and then team viewer occasionally although I'm not using team viewer much anymore what I what I have found is is that I can do a Google hangout with somebody and then I can see their screen and if I can do that I can tell them what to click and what to type and that way if it comes up and asks for a password they don't have to type it in or I mean, I don't, I don't have to ask for a password to, to use it. They type it in, and I just tell them what to do. So that's kind of what I've been doing lately. Oop, back to the water tower. Don't do that. Over here. Thank you. Next question. ZFS. Why are we not talking about ZFS here? I know it's more than a partition scheme, but it still feels relevant to the topic. And this refers to a video I did not too long ago about partitions and file systems and things like that. It's a good question, and it comes from Crux161. ZFS is a very cool next generation file system that is pretty much the default file system for OpenBSD Unix. And it is available on Linux, it's available in Ubuntu, and you can use it on your drives. The problem is, is that it's not a drop-down option when you install. So if you do a manual install of Ubuntu, you can choose the different uh, file systems that you want. You can choose between JFS, ButterFS, there's a bunch of them on there. EXT4 is usually the default, and EXT4 is one of the most stable. It's probably the most stable system in Linux right now as far as file systems are concerned. I'm not going to really talk much about or use ZFS myself until it becomes a drop-down option. And that's a little bit down the road because they're still working out some details on how that works. And so that's why I don't really talk much about it. But ZFS is very cool. And if you listen to Jeremy O'Connell with CyberWeb Solutions and the Mr. Desktop and Mr. Server podcast, and he'll tell you all about it. But right now, you really, really have to be a super nerd to install that and get that up and running on your Ubuntu system. When it becomes a drop-down option, we'll talk more about ZFS, that's for sure. Here's a question I get every now and again, and this one comes from JH Music. What is the difference between doing sudo apt-get install and sudo apt-install? All right, so in... Debian based systems like Ubuntu and Debian the software management system that runs in the background that does all of the keeping up with packages and dependencies and all that stuff is called apt and the apt get tool allows you to interface with that from a command line and apt get is old school it's been around for a long long time and apt get has a lot of options and then I would guess two or three years ago this other tool came along called apt where you don't have to type the get and apt is more streamlined it kinda works pretty much the same way so if you're doing the really basic stuff like you want to install something remove something uh, the syntax on the command line is exactly the same 
However, apt does not have all of the options that apt-get has. It is intended to be a more streamlined tool for simple management. So not everything works in apt that worked in apt-get. Now, at some point, I am sure that apt-get will be deprecated and we will just all have apt on our machine as long as the snaps and the flat packs don't take over package management entirely. But for now, you have two. So what I tend to do is I use apt-get in scripts. When I write a script and I tell the system to do something, I will use apt-get because it's more lightweight and it doesn't generate a progress bar on the output. So like the apt tool, if you run it, you'll notice you get this groovy little progress bar down at the bottom of the screen. Well, that kind of sucks in scripts and when you're trying to send the output somewhere, I don't need all that overhead. Apt-get, like I said, also does things that apt won't do. So sometimes you'll be looking for a fix to a problem and you'll see that somebody says to type in apt get in some command and it does something differently. So that's why there are two of them but for basic stuff installation, removal, purging, updating the system, that sort of thing the commands are completely interchangeable and you can elect to type in apt get or you can elect to type in apt and they will work the same. Next. All right. Uh, Useful feedback to end up the video here. I just thought this was kind of fun to show some things that people have said. and I, I really don't, I mean, you know, I'm trying to figure out, this This whole thing is giving me the, the heebie-jeebies because it's so different. Uh, this one comes from Blank Palette 2. Please don't do videos anymore. You don't have the knowledge to talk about any computer software. You're confusing people. Uh, there was another comment that he put up there about something else that I didn't choose to put, but you know, uh, I really appreciate that positive feedback, and I will definitely take it under advisement. And uh, maybe you ought to learn how to use punctuation, capitalize, and spell as well, because when you say you're confusing people, that really needs to be Y-O-U-R-E. But I do appreciate that feedback, and I will definitely work on that. You know, And here's a really nice comment that I got. It says, I'm currently going for my BS in cybersecurity and have taken a few Unix classes, and I have to say, you by far are the best teacher as of yet. Thank you. And that's from Randolph S. I want to tell you, I get a lot of compliments on this channel. It happens a lot. But that is the one that really, oh, that made my day. Thank you so much. And I will tell you why. Because um, somebody asked me, I was trying to look for this question too to include in the comments. Somebody asked me a while back, have you ever been a teacher? And the answer is yes. I ended up being a, a, a I taught some classes um, in in automation automation systems for radio back in the 90s the radio and television industry went through a revolution and that is we went from having you know record players CD players tape machines in the studio to having systems that had the music on hard drive and these systems were automated they offered automation and I was right there and I decided pretty early on that I would have to be the man that learned how to use the machine so I jumped right in, into that and learned all I could about it and what I ended up doing probably starting about 1997 was the first time this happened I was asked to come teach a class um, at a vocational school that I had actually attended 10 years earlier and so I was there and taught computer automation for radio and television and I was teaching kids from 14 to college students that were in this class and I did that twice uh, once in 1997 and again in 2001 and they were just short contract jobs they weren't like full-time teaching but I really enjoyed it and then also along the way I, I've talked at some colleges. I once uh, years ago went to William and Mary College in Williamsburg, Virginia and talked to the communications class there because at that time I was being I was an operations manager of a radio station not too far down the road and they asked me to do that so I've done some lectures and things like that and I really really got a kick out of it. I just enjoyed it so much and working with the kids it was great. Uh, I did apply for a full-time teaching position at one point in time but I didn't get it 
Because, I mean, honestly, I wasn't really that qualified for it. I, I know a lot about I know a lot about computers, and I have some certificates, but I don't have degrees. So, eh, it didn't work out. But, so, when somebody says something like that to me now, it, it really makes me very happy because I have taught. And also, while I did a lot of training sessions with people, for, you know, when I was working for companies where I was the ops manager running all of this uh, automation stuff, you'd get new stuff in or you'd get new people in and they would have to be trained. So it was always my job to train the newbies. And I worked with a lot of different people and I found out pretty quick how to get people who have no clue what the technology is about it, at least give them some sort of foothold so they know how to understand it. So, yeah, teaching is something that I really like to do. And, you know, there's that question that people ask, what is it that... What is it that you would most like to do if you weren't doing what you're doing now? Teaching. But in a way, I am teaching because I'm doing it through YouTube. But I'd like to do some classes. I really would. So thank you very much for the positive feedback. And that was a high compliment from Randolph S. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's watched this video. I do appreciate it. If you'd like to find out more about Easy Linux, do check out easylinux.com. You can contact me there through the contact us page also check out easy linux on facebook if you are a facebook user and if you would give it a like and check out freedompenguin.com for lots of really cool stories about linux and we will do this again soon thank you so much for watching